Good morning. Uh, I first uh, would like to thank Dr. Rick Furman and uh, the organizers of this uh, meeting to invite me to speak to you today on uh, novel insights in CLB cells and their microenvironment opportunities for therapy. I do this on behalf of the research team listed here, particularly from Mayo Clinic Drs. Braggio and Ghosh, from MD Anderson, Dr. Jan Berger, who's kind enough to lend me some of the uh, slides on his recent work on nurse-like cells. Much of the funding for this work, uh, both from the Mayo Clinic and MD Anderson, has been via CLA Global Foundation and the NCI R01 funds. I also want to thank Dr. Jennifer Brown for sharing some of the recent work that she's done on clonal evolution in CLL. Now, the learning objectives for this talk are uh, uh, relatively straightforward, and they're threefold. First, to appreciate the interactions between CLB cells and their microenvironment, to understand the key elements of this microenvironment and how they sustain the CLL process, and then finally, to uh, attempt to explain to you how we exploit these elements for targeted therapeutic strategies. And this can go one of two ways. Either they provide unique approaches, and I hope to show you that today, or they support and provide additional rationale for current approaches. Now, the, the world of CLL in 2013 is indeed complex. Now, obviously, we have to continue to study the biology of the CLB cell. However, we and others have been very interested in the microenvironment that surrounds this leukemic cell. And so in the 1980s, we were particularly interested in the immune system with respect to the two-way interaction of T cells, NK cells, and dendritic cells. In the 1990s, we became very interested in the nurse-like cell uh, and its two-way interaction, as well as stromal cells, particularly the bone marrow, and how both of these cells can nurture and enhance leukemic cell survivorship. In the 21st century, we became very interested in angiogenesis and angiogenic cytokines and the crosstalk between CLL B cells and that milieu. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, most recently in the um, it, it, several years, starting about three or four years ago, we became interested in nanoparticles or microvesicles, which have an extremely effective way of communicating and changing the function of CLLB cells, <coughs> excuse me, and stromal cells. Now, some other rationales for why to study the microenvironment. I want to remind you that the microenvironment, particularly in human solid tumors, has been shown to be critical for cancer initiation and progression. And while this has been somewhat neglected for hematologic malignancies, increasingly uh, we are becoming interested in this, and certainly uh, for CLL, the <clears throat> gold standard has been the impact of stromal cells or bone marrow stromal cells, BMSC, as well as nurse-like cells as being extremely important in protecting the CLL B cell uh, from cell death. Now, the novel insights I'm going to review for you are threefold, somewhat limited by time today, but I want to emphasize these because I think they do illustrate <clears throat> some of the learning objectives I mentioned. First, the evidence that stromal cells and nurse-like cells are relevant to disease progression. Some recent data we have on a novel uh, receptor tyrosine kinase called Axel that's involved in both CLL survivorship and on stromal cell function. And then finally, uh, recent data that we and others have that CLB cells within their environment can experience clonal evolution that permits emergence of drug-resistant clones. Let's turn first to stromal cell insights. We've generated a, and published on a model that looks at MSC, marrow stromal cells with leukemic cells, and one of the interesting things that occurs there is that both cell types become activated. So for CLLB cells, when it interacts with the stromal cell, there's enhanced survivorship and activation of that cell. But it's also true for the stromal cell, they become activated and have enhanced migration and proliferation at least. One of the most important outcomes, though, has been a so-called angiogenic switch, where there's an increased amount of VEGF, if you will, in the milieu, and a decreased amount of anti-angiogenic cytokines, such as thrombospondin. And a switch of, at least, of as little as 5% of that ratio can be associated with disease progression. Now, we currently believe the interaction between these two cells primarily occurs through secreted products, and I'll describe this in more detail. We believe right now that that interaction, uh, which is likely related to disease progression, is mediated through platelet-derived growth factor and its receptor. Now, if you will, this is the model. There's a stromal cell surrounded by copious numbers of leukemic cells, CLLB cells, 
we found out they can secrete PDGF, the yellow triangles. The, this PDGF binds to PDGF receptors on the stromal cell, and this results in extremely robust activation of PI3 kinase AKT. One of the important outcomes of this is the synthesis and secretion of VEGF at very high levels, and this VEGF has twofold effect as well. First of all, that VEGF can impact on CLOB cells and enhance survivorship, primarily through increases in the anti-apoptotic proteins MCL1 and XIAP, and this can further promote chemoresistance and disease progression. In addition, VEGF enhances angiogenesis in the tissue sites, in bone marrow and lymph nodes, and this neovascularization, which is clearly evident on, on biopsies, is strongly associated with disease progression. So just in summary of this particular aspect, we know that stromal cells from CLO patients can crosstalk, both cell types become activated. And as I mentioned, this angiogenic switch can facilitate disease progression. This has underscored the rationale for trials we've run, including penistatin cyclophosphamide rituximab with anti-VEGF or bevacizumab, uh, a trial we've just completed, and also there's another trial which has been run at MD Anderson using FCR with bevacizumab. In addition, this, uh, uh, this study uh, uh, did help us with rationale for the so-called green tea trials, where epigallocatechin, the major component of green tea, was given by us to early-stage early non-progressive CLO patients and in fact, in, that, in those studies, phase one and two, they just, we've just reported those as being active in those early stage patients. But I do want to focus on stromal activation and this mediation by PDGF, PDGF receptor. We believe there are therapeutic opportunities here based on that interaction. Thus, there are at least monoclonal antibodies available to PDGF and its receptor. There are now single chain antibody fragments, so-called single chain FBs, that target the, both that receptor as well as VEGFA, and we continue to pursue that possibility. Let me turn now to the nurse-like cell insights. So in work done by Jan Berger, he's very interested in whether or not he could detect the global picture of signal pathway activation. And so for this, he cultures nurse-like cells with leukemic CLO B cells. And what you see here is a dendrogram showing the upregulated genes in red and the downregulated genes in green. Most of these genes that are upregulated, curiously, are BCR, or B cell receptor related, or NF kappa V. But in particular, I'll have you focus on the blue box, where they have found increases of two chemokines, CCL3 and 4, which are T cell attractive chemokines that do enhance even uh, normal B cell function as well as leukemic B cell survivorship. What he has done is drilled down deeper and then looked at uh, CLL clones, uh, if you see on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, where he's looked at three and four, where they're incubated with and without nurse-like cells, and after two weeks, you see that the increase in three and four is primarily related to ZAP70 positive clones. And this is consistent with the uh, adverse prognosis we see in ZAP70 positive patients. Now, he's also looked at protein secretion of these chemokines in nurse-like co-cultures on the left-hand side of the slide. You see the increase in both chemokines based on ELISA and culture supernatant over two weeks. And again, he feels that ZAP70 positive clones secrete more. He's also shown that by B cell receptor triggering using anti-IgM, there are uh, robust increases of both three and four uh, with that triggering. Now, he's then turned to whether or not these chemokines can be inhibited, and he's looked at uh, both um, CCL3 and 4, where these are triggered by B-cell receptor-induced anti-IgM or nurse-like cell co-cultures. Here is a set of experiments where adelacib has been used, so, uh, used to be called Cal-101, which I could pronounce much easier. This is a PI3 kinase uh, delta inhibitor. And what you see is decreases in the CCL3 and 4 with exposure to Cal-101 uh, and the BCR triggering. And for the nurse-like cell co-cultures, very robust, significant downregulation of these T-cell uh, chemokines uh, in the co-culture system. What about abrutinib, uh, which you're going to hear a lot about, the BTK inhibitor uh, that's been tested in, a lot of clin in many clinical trials in CLL. Interestingly, he's shown that both 3 and 4 are robustly decreased when uh, these co-cultures with nurse-like cells and leukemic cells are, um, uh, have abrutinib added to the co-culture, and you see 
statistically significant non-regulation of both chemokines using this agent. So what's the therapeutic opportunity here? Well, he has shown that CLB cells interact with nurse-like cells or when BCR is stimulated, generate these two chemokines. These attract T cells that can in turn activate and nurture leukemic B cells. Now, the current dogma is likely that the nurse-like cell and the BCR work through the BCR receptor pathway. And as you're going to hear more about, um, uh, I'm sure from Dr. Furman as well, is that these signals are mediated through kinases such as sick BTK and PI3 kinases, and they're important for maintenance and proliferation of the clone. So given the above, we would postulate that there is additional rationale for the use of signal inhibitors including adelacib or abrutinib, to modify the crosstalk between CLL cells and nurse-like cells. Let's turn now from that to microvesicles. Now, I just want to, because this may be a little bit unclear to some who have not stayed familiar with this literature, microvesicles are really nanoparticles that are very closely related to other small particles, including exosomes and apoptotic bodies, but they're also clearly different. I just want to remind you that cells, normal cells and malignant cells, are capable of releasing these microvesicles. They can release them from endosomes or from plasma membrane and thereby be distinguished as to whether they're exosomes or microvesicles. However, perhaps the most important thing to remember is that these small particles contain uh, very large numbers of proteins, receptors, RNA, microRNAs, and they can be transferred effectively between cells. Just to give you a better idea of the way these, uh, what the size of these particles, exosomes are approximately the size of a virus, whereas microvesicles are, can be up to one micron and resemble more the size of bacteria, and apoptotic bodies are much larger and, of course, are released only from cells undergoing apoptosis. Our gold standard uh, uh, for measuring and at least assessing whether we have microvesicles is they're an exon positive due to membrane flipping during their formation and become uh, an exon positive because of phosphatidylserine exposure. Now we found in published that microvesicles in CLL patients are abundant in the plasma. These are primarily leukemic derived as the disease progresses. They can bind to and activate CLL B cells, and they can bind to and activate stromal cells. And this is just to give you an idea of uh, these particles. They're obviously uh, only detectable by electron uh, microscopy uh, in any real way. Once you purify them, you can see they're small globular uh, uh, particles uh, with a very distinct uh, flip membranes. Now, what about this interaction with stromal cells, an aspect I want to emphasize today? Just to give you an idea of the extent and robustness of this interaction, let me show you one experiment. Here we grew uh, stromal cells on slide chambers and incubated them with fluorescent label microvesicles, and then we followed them for various periods of time, followed by confocal. And hopefully you can see that in this uh, brightly lit room, but over the first couple of hours, there's really just a little bit of membrane binding of these fluorescent uh, my microvesicles. At four hours, there is some internalization, but by 6, 24, and 48, there is extremely robust and consistent internalization of these microvesicles. Now, one of the things that we have become interested in, what does this internalization mean to the stromal cell? And what one of the things we found is that they generate very uh, robust AKT activation. So here you see both CLL and normal stromal cells uh, and what you, we have done is incubate them for various periods of time from 30 minutes to 24 hours with these two stromal cell types. And hopefully you can appreciate the very robust activation of phospho-AKT over that time. And please note, it's sustained. It's not just a brief moment. Now we've wondered, what does this AKT activation mean to the stromal cell? And for that, we've turned to VEGF. And one of the two of the reasons are listed here. First, as I told you, VEGF is a survival factor for CLL B cells. We've also recently found that there is spontaneous secretion of VEGF um, and it's, uh, from both stromal cells, but it's much higher. And you can see here a threefold uh, spontaneous secretion of VEGF uh, from CLL stromal cells compared to normal. Now, I want to share with you one experiment that kind of dissects that out. So in this particular set of experiments, what you're seeing is normal stromal cells, CLL stromal cells, Note the low level of spontaneous secretion in the white column, 
for the two marrow uh, stromal cell types. A very robust activation of VEGF with exposure to microvesicles alone in the blue column. And there is increase of the normal stromal cells, but note it does not yet reach the spontaneous secretion level that we saw in CLL stromal cells. But one of the most interesting things is the differential response to signal inhibitors. So here we exposed the stromal cells to either Wartman and Arapamycin. And please note that the CLL stromal cells are not inhibited in terms of VEGF secretion by Wartman, an API3 kinase inhibitor, but they are by rapamycin, a mTOR inhibitor. And for normal stromal cells, we found that there is roughly equivalent ability of these two inhibitors to block VEGF synthesis. Now, what do we think is happening here? Let me uh, take you through this a little bit. So here, uh, you're looking at a PI3 kinase HIF pathway where HIF is the master regulator of VEGF. And uh, one of the things we believe is happening with the microvesicle is it's altering these pathways to the, to the betterment, if you will, of the CL disease process. Now, let me remind you that Wartman does not block VEGF secretion in, nor in CLL stromal cells, but rapamycin did. What we found is that the CLL stromal cell has elevated levels of phosphoric one just endogenously, but when you expose them to microvesicles, the ERK1 goes up even higher, and please note that phosphoric can circumvent the PI3 kinase AKT activation of mTOR, upregulate HIF1, and then generate, result in the generation of more VEGF. So let me um, show you another model of what we think is happening. We believe these microvesicles in CLO plasma, which are abundant, bathe and continuously bathe the tumor microenvironment, in this case, the stromal cell, and we believe they reprogram these stromal cells so that they can facilitate, if not generate, disease progression. And I showed you one example of that with VEGF-165 being inordinately secreted by stromal cells. What is the therapeutic opportunity here? We, we are aware that dianexin is a homodimer of anexin A5, and it binds to phosphatidylserine with very high affinity. It turns out that dianexin is presently being developed as an antithrombotic medication and injury reperfusion blocker. And it actually is being tested in clinical trials, and we're very interested in pursuing that as a way to block the interaction between the microvesicle in plasma and the microenvironmental uh, aspects of, for example, stromal cells. I also want to mention to you that we found that microvesicles, microvesicles can induce receptor tyrosine kinases, and here's uh, the way we did that. We just exposed stromal cells to microvesicles from CLL patients and then performed an RTK antibody array to look at the RTKs on CLL stromal cells. What you see here is a variety of RTKs that are elevated, but I want you to focus on phosphoaxyl, which is inordinately increased much above and repetitively above the other RTKs. Because of that, we then looked at the expression of axle on stromal cells and, in fact, do find it is expressed at higher levels than normal stromal cells and is often activated as shown by its phosphorylation here. We then found that axle RTK is actually present on these microvesicles. This led us to look at the uh, possibility these, axle, these receptors were also on CLB cells and we found and published, as you see here in this western blot, from 10 patients that there is fairly obvious expression of activated axial receptor. Now, it turns out, and happily so, I believe, that there are a variety of axial inhibitors available, and these are actually orally bioavailable. We've tested a variety of these in our laboratory, and I'm just showing you one dose response curve for 20 different CLO patients where you see a very uh, rapid uh, a rapidly elevating dose response curve, and please note that the killing here is at nanomolar doses, something we don't typically see in the laboratory when we test for leukemic cell to cell death. We've also found that axial inhibitors can target, they actually do target the phosphoaxyl here. You see three different patients where, by Western blot, the exposure to the oral axial inhibitor does downregulate phosphoaxyl. So, what's the therapeutic opportunity here? We've now found that axial RTK is expressed not only on um, leukemic B cells, but also on stromal cells within the bone marrow. And we know that axial inhibition can induce robust CLL B cell apoptosis at the least. 
So we believe this uh, axle RTK inhibition has promise for both inducing B cell um, uh, apoptosis and also in modifying stromal cell function. And as I said before, there are oral bioavailable axle inhibitors that have promise for clinical trials, and we pursue that uh, very actively. Let me, uh, in the last segment of my talk, turn to clonal evolution. And uh, for that, I want to briefly explain how we got into this a few years ago. Uh, so Dr. Braggio, uh, who's at Scottsdale uh, Mayo Clinic, and I really, um, not, not surprisingly, uh, were aware of the primary hypothesis, I'm sure all of us in this room are, that the evolution of clones within tumors in general uh, uh, do underlie cancer progression and relapse, and obviously genetic evolution plays a, likely plays a key role in CLL. Now, our initial approach to study clonal evolution in CLL was to use a ray CGH and validation fish. So let me briefly explain about our ray CGH. It's, it's essentially a global a genomic DNA analysis looking for amplifications, breakpoints, um, deletions, if you will, copy number abnormalities that can be detected. You can make probes to these if you detect them, and you can use these uh, probes to use validation fish to estimate the percentages of B cells that have these CNAs. And for this work, what we did was we took a CL cohort that had progressive disease and were then treated on a common chemoimmunotherapy trial, in this case, pentastatin, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, or PCR. We then studied three time points, or TP, time point one, close to diagnosis, time point two, at entry to the PCR trial, and then time point three, at relapse. This slide outlines a little bit more about the approach. So on the left-hand side, you see the array CGH. The three time points were in the blue boxes. We uh, the detectable CNAs that were found. We made probes to these uh, abnormalities, and then, as I said, we use validation fish to detect the percentages of B cells that carried these CNAs. Now, let me take you through how this tells you about clonal architecture using this approach. So here's a founder clone for a particular patient that has trisomy 12 and 19. There then are at least two subclones, A and B, where A is dominant. In fact, for B subclone, there was a C subclone. Realize that A and B now have the 12 and 19, but they have non-overlapping additional mute CNAs, and the C subclone actually has its own distinctive CNAs. Note over time, then, this clonal architecture remains roughly the same, but in terms of evolution, the B subclone emerges as a dominant clone uh, at relapse, which is time point three, and A becomes minimal. Turns out that using this approach, there are at least three different types of leukemic, uh, if you will, clonal architecture. There's a linear branching and a multi-branching. The linear is what we expected to see. That was the dogma at the time we began our studies. And so the linear is one clone where over time the, that clone will generate additional copy number abnormalities or mutations, and that's the clone that will be present at relapse as well. For the branching, as I explained, there are two subclones where we believe that over time in therapy, uh, one of the clones will become subdominant, the B clone in this case, and the C clone will become dominant and relapse. And it can be much more complicated than that in, my, in a minority of cases where there's at least three subclones at presentation. And then again, you see the change as the, um, as the clonal evolution occurs. Now, what is the implication of this for the patient? Does this really mean anything? In our work, uh, what we have found is a very interesting pattern. So if you see these four different patients, A, B, C, and D, the blue line represents the single, the initial dominant clone, and note that with exposure to PCR that there is a nice reduction in that clone, but unfortunately for the patient, there's an emergence of a subclone over time in all four patients, in fact, in one, two subclones. And what we saw, uh, uh, because we studied these clones over it, at multiple times uh, as the patients were being treated, that this clone was extremely resistant to subsequent therapy. Now, since our observations, there's been some extremely elegant work done by uh, at least two other laboratories, Dr. Rossi's from Italy and Dr. Brown's from Dana-Farber, where they're using other more, um, if you will, even more elegant approaches, the uh, whole exome sequencing and SNP analysis, to really corroborate that the, the, the clonal architecture is very complicated, and often emergence of these subclones is associated with resistance to therapy. 
I do want to, uh, in the last little bit of my talk, share with you some data that uh, uh, Jennifer Brown uh, allowed me to present to you today, and I think it's important in thinking about clonal evolution. So in, in studying uh, 160 CLO patients where they match tumor and normal samples, uh, because of this large cohort, they were able to detect statistically significant driver events. And these driver events are basically genetic events that confer fitness advantage on clones. Uh, and as you see here, there are um, 25 recurrent drivers. They consist of both specific mutations and copy number abnormalities. The important thing to remember here is that because of the statistical significance, this really testifies to the positive selection of these drivers and their relationship to uh, clonal resistance and to drug-resistant disease as well. I think the other very important uh, aspect to present to you is work also done by Dr. Brown and her coworkers, where they have shown you, shown to us, that these driver genes fit within specific driver pathways. And you see uh, four listed here, at least the notch, the inflammatory, the B cell receptor signaling, and the Wnt signaling pathways, where these genes can, if you will, these mutated genes can be slotted within pathways. And I obviously am not gonna go over the details of this, but it's important to indicate that uh, this not only provides us with mechanistic ideas about, about how progression and drug resistance can occur, but it does provide for therapeutic opportunities in these circumstances using these approaches. So in summary of this uh, segment, CLO patients often have multiple clones pre-therapy. These emerging subclones can become dominant after frontline therapy, and it certainly can show high resistance to secondary therapies. Prognostic and therapeutic opportunities that we see here are that the detection of the subclones and sequential evaluation can be done to monitor and follow and counsel CLL patients. And uh, as Dr. Brown and others have shown, determining the driver mutations can possibly help direct future therapies. I think this is my last slide. I guess the overall summary um, is that to completely evaluate and deal with the CLO disease process, I would propose that study of both leukemic B cells and its microenvironment will offer strategy and opportunities not available if we only study leukemic B cell. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.